Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of Throat Punch Lunch. And this is kind of a memorable episode because I believe this is going to be the last episode that carries the name Throat Punch Lunch. Uh, it's been two years and we've taken a lot of flack over uh, the name. There has been a lot of support as well uh, because people understand that it was just a joke and that it was kind of a inside tongue-in-cheek joke that was uh, made by uh, one of uh, our other contributors on the channel and it just we just kind of ran with it and there was no animosity, no violence behind it at all, but there has been a lot of um, let's just say less than cordial uh, emails and comments and so forth and so on. So we are going to change the name. Uh, I, I do appreciate all the support from everybody that said not to change it, but this is kind of a uh, executive decision that I'm going to make for my show because I do want it to be as inviting, as uh, encompassing as I possibly can, although um, there's just not much I can do about it. I know I can't please everybody, but where I can make changes and where I can um, try to appease uh, some of the masses, then I'm going to go ahead and do that. Now, having said that, I've narrowed it down uh, to two possibilities. The first possibility is one that I, that, that I feel got a lot of support, both in the comment section from the last episode and uh, in our Slack Cave discussions uh, that have been going on uh, interspersed throughout. Uh, and that is, first, first option is Token Punch Lunch. Uh, it keeps the TPL there, which is something that I wanted to uh, do just because. Uh, and then uh, the other one is one that is kind of my personal favorite, but either one of these would be fine. The first one is Token Punch Lunch. The second one is Tropical Punch Lunch. Now, I grew up drinking uh, Tropical Punch drinks and, you know, uh, uh, the fruit punch flavored drinks, I, I just really enjoyed it. So that one just kind of stuck with me as well. Uh, so nah, anyone would be absolutely fine for me. But what we're going to do here is we're going to run a, kind of a vote here. And we're going to try to do that. And if you can go into the comments section and find the two entries for these two. One is going to just simply say it'll be a post by me, a comment by me that says uh, Tropical Punch Lunch. And then there will no, be another comment by me that says uh, Token Punch Lunch. And if you would just thumb up uh, whichever comment that you would like to see become the name for this show, uh, we will run that uh, for, let's just say, seven days from this airing on the first day. So we're going to run this from the 30th all the way until the, the 6th and of, of June. And uh, we'll say midnight on, uh, on June and on June 6th. And uh, whoever, whichever one has the most comments, that's what we'll go with. Uh, I'm also going to take a poll within our Slack group uh, to see which one of these will have the most votes there. And uh, if there is a tie or anything like that, we'll use the Slack voting uh, for the tiebreaker. But that's your two choices. So I'm leaving my, my show's name in your hands, either Token Punch Lunch or Tropical Punch Lunch, and that's what we're going to do. So with all that blathering over, we're going to go ahead and get into the episode. Thank you for so much for joining us. Let's get to your lunch. This is Roy Kennedy from Epic Gaming Night, and this is Why It's There, where I take a look at a game on my shelf and talk about why it's stuck around in my collection. And today I'm going to be talking about a cooperative game that has a hidden trader that helped get me into the board gaming hobby, and that is Shadows Over Camelot. Shadows Over Camelot is an amazing game that, from the looks of it, it's like you're just trying to collect different sets of cards to complete these quests, but underneath all that, there's this crazy thing that feels like a fantasy game where you're running around trying to complete quests together and you're like King Arthur and all the different knights around the table. You all have asymmetrical like special abilities that you're trying to use to help you get cards or exchange cards or do different things around the board. You're, there's a quest for the Holy Grail where you're basically just trying to get those cards and put them down there before too many of the, like the despair cards come up and mess that quest up. Then there's like different sets where you're trying to 
take out the picks and saxons by getting straights. We were trying to do certain quests with the like Black Knight. We were trying to get like full houses and pairs and things like that. And it's just a, a game that on the outset seems pretty simple, but the cooperative aspect of this game is what makes it great because you're trying to figure out how to go around, who's going to go where, what quests are you going to take out, and all the while you're drawing black cards off the deck that do all sorts of things to screw you up. And you're hoping that it's not things that are too terrible and go in the wrong place. There's also one where it's like, oh, you go over there and just discard cards to try to get um, the uh, sword Excalibur. And there's all sorts of different quests you can go around and do, which is a lot of fun. I've had an amazing time playing this with my friends and family and game group. The hidden trader aspect of this game is always crazy. And there's been tons of amazing situations and stories where this has come to play. I remember playing it once on my birthday and I was like, I'm gonna play this game. I'm not even gonna look at my loyalty card. I'm just gonna play as a good guy. We're just gonna do great things. I mean, the game can sometimes make you lose anyway. So I'm just not gonna look. So we got, and I worked really hard the whole time in the game. And we got to like, just at the very edge where we were gonna win as the good guys. And uh, one of my friends is like, well, it's this late in the game. Roy didn't look at his card. I'm just going to accuse him of being the traitor just because. I didn't even look at my card and flipped it over and I was a traitor and they ended up getting more white swords and winning the game. So I worked the whole game trying to do things and I ended up losing at the very end. There's another game where I was I was the traitor. I knew I was the traitor the whole game and I was like, hmm, I'm just going to work as hard as I can towards the good stuff and try to set up the game so it's kind of like that parody where if they don't know I'm the traitor at the very end, then a couple of the swords will flip the black swords and I'll end up winning and we had it just right and I was like okay so uh we win the game as long as no one's a traitor nobody's a traitor right nobody's a traitor cool we have a game win oh wait I'm the traitor ah ha ha and then I played a game with my brother and sister-in-law um and my wife which we really enjoyed and we we're playing the whole game and we're like oh man the catapults we gotta stop the catapults we're like one or two away and um we're like oh you need to fight catapults we're telling my sister-in-law she needs to fight the catapults and do stuff to make catapults not happen she's like nah I'm good I'll just put a catapult out there and I'll draw and I'll get this thing and like made us lose the game and we were like what what are you doing you only do that you're the traitor because we, we were thinking she didn't know what she was doing and she just took us out in the game and she was the traitor and we're like oh man so there's many so many crazy stories we've had playing shadows over camelot and it's been a blast the entire time it's a game that people can jump in and out of really quickly and this is one of the games that like you can play with seven players and still have a blast which is pretty crazy because it seems like a huge game but i played it with seven players several times and i've had a lot of fun playing so shadows over camelot is definitely an awesome game and it will stay on my shelf because it's an amazing hidden traitor game Hello fellow Throat Punch Lunchers! Like I said, I want to show you what board gaming in Poland looks like. Now, a couple of episodes back I showed you what a small convention in Poland looks like. Board games by the sea in the city of Koszalin, a few hundred people in a high school gymnasium basically. This, this is a slightly bigger convention. And when I say slightly bigger, I, uh, slightly bigger, I mean a lot bigger, because basically this started out in the year 2000, somewhere around the year 2000, with just 600 participants. It started out in a high school gymnasium, gymnasium, just like that other convention that I showed you. Last year, in 2017, I don't know the numbers for this edition just yet, I don't have them, but last year, for two, 2017, Pyrkon, which is the convention I'm talking to you about, was visited by 44,000 people. And that's a lot of people. That basically is, and what I what you see here is just one of the holes. There are like five, I don't know, 10, 12 big holes, giant holes like this one with various things in them. Now, like I said, this is not strictly a board game convention. This is more of a RPG, sci-fi, fantasy convention. We have people playing role-playing games here. We have people playing LARPs. There is a lot of stuff with Star Wars that you can see, a lot of models, a lot of costumes, a lot of gadgets, a lot of toys, things like that. Obviously, a huge presence from the video gaming industry is over here as well. And a lot of, obviously, as you can imagine, a lot of young kids basically just swarm in there for like, like, like basically like a huge wave of just small, <laughs> small kids or teenagers just looking to play some new games on a brand new, wonderfully designed, I gotta say, I gotta admit, computers. But what I'm most interested in is right here. This is the uh, hall where you can find all the exhibitors, all the po po Polish board game publishers. There is a separate hall, which is like a giant gaming area, huge with a huge rental where you can rent a game, sit down, and just play games, basically. 
here we have publishers who sell their products, who sell their games, who show you their new prototypes, their new games. And also, as you can see, you have a lot of exhibitors that do not uh, sell only board games. They sell other stuff. They sell costumes. They sell gadgets. They sell swords. Swords for The Witcher. And I've heard uh, the guy that sells sword for, uh, swords for uh, makes is a fan, basically. And those are fan-made, but those are swords dedicated to Witcher. And I hear, I hear he's been contacted by Netflix to help them design uh, some stuff for the upcoming uh, show, The Witcher, on Netflix. So, uh, pretty cool stuff over here. A lot of new games that you can test out. A lot of cool people that you might see. Cosplay is an amazing, uh, is a huge phenomenon over here. There is a special show called Masquerada, uh, Masquerade basically, which, uh, which is just where all the best cosplayers get to perform in front of a jury and in front of a massive audience and they get to fight for, and they get to present obviously, but fight for a reward. So a lot of cosplayers over here, but mostly fun, cool people, geeks like us and who just want to hang out with fellow geeks, want to play games, want to meet new people, want to find out what else is coming up in the world of gaming, video gaming, board gaming, whatever gaming you like, you can find it here. This is an amazing place to be. This is like a small Essen, small Gen Con, but still an amazing, wonderful place that I love just coming here every year. Basically just to be around all, all of that. This is just fun. So, like I said, I only have as much time. I wanted to give you a tiny glimpse into what a big convention in Poland looks like. This is the biggest, or, uh, uh, this is the biggest sci-fi fantasy convention in Poland with a massive board games presence. So, if you ever, whenever you are in Poland, usually April, May, this is where this happens. Be sure to check it out. Thank you for watching, Sam Hidi. Thanks for inviting me, and see you next time. Bye. Hey, hey, welcome to the show. My name is Bobby, and this is these Totally Geeky Games, where I make recommendations of games for those people with geeky interests outside of our hobby. Um, our hobby being tabletop board and card games, and the geeky interest this week being Firefly slash the movie Serenity. Uh, that's right, with the recent release of the Han Solo spin-off movie from the Star Wars universe, I figured I'd cover one of my favorite um, TV shows slash movies featuring a ragtag team of renegades in space, and that's Firefly uh, slash Serenity. I'm just going to refer to it as Firefly, but I'm talking about the whole thing. The first game that I might recommend is a really light uh, push-your-luck game with fun components it's a dice rolling game called firefly shiny dice firefly shiny dice is a really simple push your luck game um um actually i hesitate to use the word simple it is a little complex it's, it's not maybe a gateway push your luck game but for those people that are interested in the theme it's a good way to get them into the hobby that's firefly shiny dice and firefly shiny dice i think one detractor from it maybe is that it's not quite as thematic as some of the other games, but one um, good thing is I like the art in it, and that is not true of the second game, that is Legendary Encounter Firefly. Legendary Encounter Firefly, I think, is a great game, probably. I'd rate everything about the game a plus, except for the art. Great game. Um, I don't really mean to talk bad about anybody, but the art in the game is not fantastic. However, really, everything else about the game is fantastic, and I figure I should let you know put it on the forefront that the art is not the best part of the game so that if you look at the game and decide you want to play it the you won't let the art detract you from that experience uh, and the number one game that i'd recommend uh probably with one qualifier that it is a bit long but i found that it's the most thematic most immersive um really definitive firefly game out there is firefly the board game from gale force 9 games um probably one of my favorite games to come out of gale force 9 um, but I really like it. It's, um, it's, you command your own ship, um, and you conduct missions and you go around the Firefly verse and, um, pick up odd jobs here and there and, um, maybe misbehave along the way. And as you're misbehaving, um, you might run into, um, trouble with the law but don't worry, you'll have the characters from Firefly, the TV show, to back you up. Um, and if you 
watch the Firefly TV show and you really like the show and you really like the verse and you really like um, everything about it, I think Firefly the board game is really the definitive board game to get into. Um, and it's not that hard. It's not that high of a learning curve. So I would say um, all of these games and even this one is just a next step game. Um, probably none of them are really gateway games except for maybe Firefly Shiny Dice. But Firefly the board game, really top notch game. Anyway, let me know in the comments what you think, um, but until next time, my name is Bobby, and this has been These Totally Geeky Games. See you on the next show. Bye. Hey folks, welcome to a new segment here on Throat Punch Lunch that uh, will probably not be very consistent. Uh, I play kids games every once in a while with uh, my youngest, Aiden, and of course my other children as well, uh, but not too often. Uh, he's pretty picky. Not new games at least. Uh, usually the, the newer kids games get taken by Tom, but every once in a while I'm able to steal a couple of them and uh, play them with my son uh, and uh, my other kids to see how they go over. And I've been doing that a lot in the last couple of weeks. We've done uh, a few different um, uh, Sam and Aiden reviews, so you can go check those out. But I just wanted to briefly talk about some of the games we've been talking about uh, playing lately, uh, because they've all pretty much been pretty big hits. Games. The first one here is uh, Scare It. This is a game by Strawberry Studios, and they've put out the Strawberry Studios is a line of games from NSKN Games, and they are specifically targeted for kids and families. And Scare It is a really cool game because it uses the paper, rock, scissors mechanism where. Um, uh, the uh, cats are scared by dogs and uh, dogs are scared by uh, elephants and elephants are scared by mice. And so you're trying to whittle down this group of kids, you, uh, this group of animals, and you are uh, you have a, a, a color and a type of animal that you're trying to have the most of at the end of the game. And you're gonna be scoring points based upon those cards and whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins. Uh, it's really neat game that teaches kids uh, about making proper choices and the consequences of those choices within a game. Mars Needs Heroes. This is a select, uh, a set collection game uh, where you are going to be uh, basically bidding for a, a group of cards that are out on the table. And if people have the same bid and they're eliminated, and whoever has the highest bid after that uh, gets to take the cards that are on the table. And, and you continually repeat that until you go through the deck. And then whoever has the most of one particular color, whatever it might be, whoever has the most of that color is the winner. If there's a tie, you go to second most and so forth and so on. Uh, but this one's really interesting because it also has a, um, a, a mechanism where you can basically trump everybody else. So this is kind of a entry level into bidding and uh, maybe the idea of, of one thing trumping everything else uh, in card games and that type of thing. And I thought it was really interesting. It has great artwork, great components as well. It really uh, hit the table very famously in our family. So check this one out. Mars Needs Heroes. And we also uh, played Robots. Now this one is one of my son Aiden's favorite games of late, mainly because he enjoys robots a lot like uh the um real steel is one of his favorite movies all the time he loves transformers he he loves uh pacific rim and uprising so robots just really are what he enjoys and you get to build your own robot in this now this basically is like an introductory level card drafting game where you are basically trying to make right choices because some of the cards are more frequent than others some of them are more rare so if you see one that you need that's worth a lot of points then maybe you want to take that one over something else it's those kinds kinds of decisions that this game really kind of uh, leads your younger kids and other family members into making those kinds of decisions in board games. So uh, this was a real hit with my family. Go check it out, Robots. Now, the next one here is All Queen's Chess. Now, this one is a, uh, basically an abstract strategy game where everybody, it's a two-player game, both persons have a number of queens on the board, and those queens can move just like a regular chess queen can move, except you can't conquer pieces and you can't jump over pieces. So you're restricted only to open areas of the board. And so uh, you're trying to get four in a row. So this is basically a really basic form of chess and... Uh, um, um, connect four. 
So uh, it's really cool. We played, I don't think we've ever played less than like five games of this at one time uh, whenever we've sat down to play it. And we've, we've sat down to play it a lot. So, and then finally, uh, another one here called Nuts. This is by Bruno Fiduti. It is a uh, kind of a, a, a light take that game, but you're always so trying to collect different kinds of sets and so forth and so on. But this one is probably the heaviest game that my son Aiden has been able to really kind of grasp and do well at and make good decisions without being told uh, what to do or being reminded of what he should or should not do in any given situation. And so that's about it. Just uh, five, what is that five? Yeah, five games uh, that you can go and check out to see if your family might uh, be interested in looking at it. I know all of these were hits with my family. Different people within the family as well uh, really enjoyed it. Some of them didn't like some of it as much as the others, but you know, that's normal. Uh, but overall, generally speaking, all five of these were hits with my family so go check them out we'll see you on the flip side hi there everyone welcome to jewels reviews i'm julie today i'm going to give you my review of odin's ravens odin's ravens is a two-player race game most games can be played in 10 to 15 minutes i'll talk about the goal of the game first the goal of odin's ravens is to get your raven through the 16 card path before the other person to begin the game, 16 cards are laid out in a line. Only six cards are shown in this example. No two same cards can be next to each other. Each player places their ravens at one end of the line. Play interaction is minimal. This is a competitive game since it's a race to win. Not only do you have cards that will help you move, you can choose from special Loki cards that can either help you or hurt your opponent. The rules to Odin's Ravens are super easy to learn and remember. The components are medium quality. I like that the Ravens are made of wood. The cards are easy to hold in your hand, but they're not the best card stock. I do like the artwork in this game. This game doesn't take long to learn and play. It's super easy to set up since the path is only made up of a line of 16 cards. If you're looking for something fun and fast to play while you're waiting for friends to arrive, or just to play in between games, this is for you. Thanks for taking time to watch Jules Reviews. I'm Julie. Have a great day. Hello there, I'm Miguel Bello, and welcome to Boards Beyond the Boards, a segment where we talk about games that are language independent or have very little language dependence. And today we'll talk about one of the Spiels der Jahre uh, nominations. Actually, I was nominated for the Kenner Spiel. Uh, Guns Shones Clever, which means you're so clever, you're pretty smart. Uh, it's a roll and write game, uh, and it's quite nice. Let me show you how it works. Each section we will give you different bonuses or points, and also uh, have a different range of numbers. So the yellow section here, you can do columns, rows, or even a center diagonal in here. And every time you complete a section here, let's say if I had all those done here, I would get 10 points. Now if I go on a column here, that means I can put a number 4 on the orange area here. So at the beginning of a player's turn, he or she will roll the dice and will pick one die, and remember you can have a maximum of 3 there, to put it on their first location and then take one of the actions down here. Now here's the thing, whenever I pick, like normally the higher numbers are better for a lot of the areas there. But if I would pick this 5 here, everything under 5 would go to the community plat platter there, and that means that other players will be able to take that action uh, at the end of your turn. The other problem too, once all your dice are there, you can't roll any more dice. So it has to have a balance, like, let's say I'll take this 3 right purple here and I'll put my three in there so everything that is under three is gonna go to the platter everything that is equal or greater stays for your next roll so I get a re-roll say I decide to take this four green here and then I would be I would cross my four it would give me ten points at the end of the game and I would get another extra die in there and you keep doing this uh, one thing about the white die is a wild. So anytime you use a white die, 
you can put anywhere you want it. Now there's a specific thing when you choose blue, let's say I choose this four blue here. So the blue section, it's always the blue die plus the white die. So if I take this four here, I would have, doesn't matter if the die is on your roll or in there, four plus two would be a six. I would mark the six in there and that would be that. And so it doesn't matter if it was a two here, would be four, uh, or if that was a three, it would be five, and so forth. So you, you understand the gist. Now the great thing about this game is that as you complete things, you might uh, create chain reaction. Let's say uh, I would be all the way over here, and then I would be over here, so I get a four yellow, I cross here, that means I get a X on the green, I would X out there, so that gives me an X on the blue, I would X down here, that means I would get another die here. So those are awesome when you do that. So you do the little combos, and moments that you might do like four or five combos at a time, you'll be able to gain Fox during the game. Now what the Fox does, at the end of the game, you're gonna multiply the Fox as many as you have, so if you had three, by the lowest score you have. The game has kind of an interaction with other players because you're really depending on what they're uh, rolling and you're gonna take action while other players are rolling the dice because you get the leftover dice. So it's kind of an interesting. It's different from another roll and right, you know, kind of games that you wait everybody to do their stuff and then your turn. You were kind of uh, always paying attention to what's going on. So. Uh, Gunshun's clever, it's a top hit for me, love the game, and I see you guys next time. Thanks for watching. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Cardboard Herald's Rook and Record, where we pick the perfect soundtrack for you to listen to while playing our favorite board games. And thank you for joining me on such a lovely day for a bicycle ride, which is fitting because today we are talking about Flamme Rouge, the awesome racing cycling game that perfectly encapsulates what it's like to be on a bicycle. It's thrilling, it's intense, it's invigorating, it is fun, it's approachable and it is elegant. All of these things are reasons why I love cycling and why I love this game. It is a really, really good game, but we're here to talk about music, and the perfect thing for you to listen to is, boom, Cream's Disraeli Gears, and this goes beyond the fact that it's awesome rock music. It goes beyond the fact that this is a killer super group consisting of Ginger Breaker, Jack Bruce, and Eric Clapton himself. No, this goes beyond even the fact that the name of the album, Disraeli Gears, takes its origin from a mispronunciation of a derailleur on a bicycle. No, the reason why we are picking this album is because this has an appreciation Ooh, even more bicycles. Now, the reason why we're picking this album is because it has an appreciation for the things of the past while trying to innovate and move forward, taking the blues music that Eric Clapton grew up on, reinterpreting it into this hard rock three-piece shell. The other thing is that there's a physicality, a momentous drive to this album generated by these three individuals that just propels it forward in an intense, incredible, way while still retaining the kind of sophistication and elegance that their sheer mastery of their respective instruments and craft allows them to create. So the perfect album for you to listen to while riding your bike or while playing Flam Rouge is going to be Cream's Disraeli Gears. So thank you so much for watching the Cardboard Herald. Let me know what you thought of our pick. What did you think of Cream? And what is your favorite album to listen to while playing Flam Rouge? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. I've been Jack for the Cardboard Herald. And the more that we do of these, the less bad music you will have to suffer at the table. Everyone, this is Tim Jean at the Metal Maple, and this is the Budget Board Game Breakdown.
So in this video, we're not talking about something that's probably considered a budget item, but I really do enjoy it. This is my big Viking mat from vikingmats.com. This thing is huge. I have a massive table. It is a 72 by 43 inch table, I believe. I got the mat custom cut, took a couple months to get in. This is a 71, I believe, by 41 inch mat. I tried to get about an inch away from all the edges so that you can see the table. It's a rather nice, expensive table. I really like the feel of it. The problem is the table is rather soft. The wood is very soft. When I put my podcast stuff on here, I've dropped, uh, if you're familiar with XLR cables, the ends are metal. Sometimes they'll hit uh, even from a couple of inches and make a divot. Very saddening since the table is so, so nice. So I wanted to get something to protect the table and to protect my cards. And the reason I'm posting about this in a video is because on the Dice Tower Facebook group, some people asked me to make a video and here it is. So this isn't really a review. I have no affiliation with the company that I bought it from. It's just simply my thoughts on it so far. I've played it on a couple of times and I've had it for a couple of weeks. You can see this, this is the Terra Mystica board. I mean, this thing's a massive cut. It was about $150 for this size cut. I, th I believe they have like a small, medium, large and extra large size. And you kind of get within a certain uh, dimensions in that size range. And that generates how much, uh, how much it actually is uh, as far as cost. So the reason you might want a mat first off is one, it's less expensive than a gaming table unless you build it yourself, probably even less expensive than the wood it would take to do that. And this, this is, um, it's going to make gaming feel real nice. Now, the th first thing I was concerned about was this thing's five millimeters thick and I was very excited about that, but they said in some other posts, some of the customers said that it was very soft and malleable and it is. Let me show you on this over here. If you put a card against the edge and kind of press, you can see how it quickly fills in that gap, whereas most play mats won't do that. Not mouse pads, things like that. But it is super thick. Here's the uh, Dice Tower play mat that I use in most of my videos. And you can see how thick that is. I mean, this is just so thin in comparison. This thing's five millimeters thick, but it's very soft. The back isn't textured, but it is grippy. So it does grip the table nicely and doesn't move around. Um, anyway. One, one cool thing that you might want to play mat for is for cards. If you play with them unsleeved, sometimes you lay them on the board uh, or on the table and you try to grab them and you might dig into the edges and with your fingernails and stuff like that. Or some people might, but this you can actually dig your finger into. I mean, you don't have to do it that dramatic, but you can barely just pull. I mean, it's just so nice. Cards, well, when you're dealing them, they, they slide across it fairly nice. Kind of like a poker tournament, uh, except maybe not as expensive of a table. And uh, the dice, they bounce really nice. They don't really make a lot of sound. Let me roll them on this. Here we go. I mean, they bounce almost too nice. They'll, they'll actually go flying everywhere if you let them hit the board too much. I don't know if I like the bounce so much, but it is kind of fun. But most people, if they roll it controlled, it does give off uh, just an area here. Let me see if you can hear this. Very quiet, whereas considering, you know, so I really do like play mats, but this thing is just a massive play mat, covers your whole table. I mean, this is, this is just phenomenal. I like the feel. They have like eight or nine colors and I got the blue because my favorite color is blue. I was using a burgundy colored cloth in most of my reviews and I think I'm going to switch to just using this. The only concern I have right now is I'm kind of OCD with things a little bit and uh, when you punch a new game and you start playing a new game on this, the little pieces, little flakes from the punches are going to be all over this mat. So keep a, uh, what is that, like a lint roller close, really helps out. But overall, like I said, play mats are really awesome. A gaming mat for your entire table is even better. Uh, one, because it's, you know, it's really hard to find a gaming table mat that's all solid color. You know, you can buy those war game mats probably around the same cost, but they have like, you know, trees or forest and, and uh, like a cityscape and things like that. And I, I play war games, so those are nice, but this is very nice. And um, yeah, so if you have a gaming mat or if you have any, you know reasons why you think other people should have one, comment below. If you have any questions about this, let me know below or email me at tim, <coughs> timjanets at gmail.com. Follow, follow me on social media at the handle below. Check out my podcast, Meeple Core. And until next time, keep on rocking and rolling dice. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back to a Fellowship of Meeples. Hi, everyone. I'm Doug Jr. with Doug and Doug Gaming. 
And today on the Fellowship of Meeples, I want you to imagine that you're taking a trip. You're visiting, let's say, Florida. Because you know, sooner or later, everybody visits Florida, right? That's what we do here, it's tourism. But if you're driving in from the west, you're very likely going to hit a stretch of an interstate, Interstate 10, that comes through what we call the Panhandle of Florida. Now this is the often forgotten part of Florida, sometimes referred to as Lower Alabama. We do not find this amusing. However, if you come about 56 miles into the state from the west, you'll find a town called Crestview, Florida. Now in this unassuming little town, you would also find a game store, an FLGS, Friendly Local Game Store. This is actually one of the best game stores around, not because it's the biggest, not because they have the best selection, although they do have a great selection and it is a very good sized store. So today I want to introduce you to the owners of the Game Masters Guild Game Store in Crestview, Florida. Their names are Dave and Val, and they make it possible for our game group to have a great place to meet and play games. Hi, my name is Valerie. I'm originally from Northwest Florida. I was uh, born here in Fort Walton Beach and raised in Defuniac Springs, and then moved here when I married Dave. So I've pretty much been in this area my whole life. I'm Dave. I was originally born in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. I served in the Air Force for about four years, and I was a fireman there down there at Hobart Field. And uh, many, many years ago, I met my wife Valerie and she decided to help me open a store. And well, of course, after that, I wanted to find out how did they get started in gaming? Because I was always into the role playing and everything first. I mean, hardcore, hardcore. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons, um, playing books like Robotech and all that stuff. Uh, then I was into Magic, and I know you were always into games. Oh yeah, I, I was definitely a board gamer growing up. I More of the conventional stuff, like Sorry, Monopoly, stuff like that, but knew about some little stuff here and there, like I had learned about Magic the Gathering in high school uh, from some friends, but didn't really understand it, and I was like, ah, whatever, what is that? <laughs> uh, but then met then when I met back up with him later and we got together, um, he started teaching me more about the card games like Magic and Pokemon, and uh, and then he's been trying for years to get me to play D&D, and I finally did. The third question I asked Val and Dave was, how did this store get started? We started at the local flea market, um, that was way back. In yeah, that was back in May 2005. He decided he was just going to start ordering a bunch of random collections off of eBay so that he could decide to set up a flea market booth. And unbeknownst to me, I thought, oh, he's just a gamer. He's a collector. He's, he's just getting a bunch of stuff for himself. No, he decided he wanted to start the reselling. I said, well, if we start this, we're not going to be able to stop it because we're going to start gaining customers and people are going to mm. expect us there. So... Yeah, kind of May 2005 was the start of it, and then it grew into the giant 4,500 square foot store that it is today, over 12 years later. Because we did the flea market yeah. for a year and a half, out of business mm -hmm. for six. Cause six they, months. Because yeah. they sold the flea market, so yep. we, we couldn't be there. And then we got a small place, and then we were working constantly, and coming yeah. in the evenings to open it up. Yeah, it was like terrible. Our hours. customers were like, why are you only open from like six to nine at night? Because we had day jobs too, so um, that was that was, that was part of the sacrifice in doing it. We we kept both jobs for a while and then eventually like I said just just slowly grew everything to, to what it is today so well next episode be sure and join us again we're going to find out a little more about Val and Dave who they are and what makes them tick thank you so much for joining us on a fellowship of meeples We're back with Sarah and Haley, and we're looking at the game that all of you voted on, Magic Maze and Ink and Gold. So we're going to play them, we're going to see what they like, what they didn't like, and which one was their favorite. Let's get to it. Okay, we're going to see what Haley thinks first. So let's talk about Magic Maze first. Cooperative game, you're trying to get each of the guys out of the maze, and you can only move a certain direction. You can't talk, and you have a timed element too. What did you like most about this game? I really liked that it had like a little puzzle effect here. You had to like move through and you really couldn't communicate. And it was stressful when you saw the timer running down and you're like, oh, I can't yeah, get done. Yeah, and it's hard like you can use this pawn to like tell someone to do something even though you can't talk. But you don't even know which one they're talking about. Exactly. You put that in front right? of you. Is there anything you didn't like about it? 
I mean, I'm sure it's not surprising, but I didn't like that we couldn't talk. Um, mm -hmm. It made the whole, everything super, super difficult, and it was really unclear what people wanted you to do when mm -hmm. they just threw this in front of you, and you're like, yeah. I don't even know what color you're talking about. Did you so. feel like you got the hang of it as you kept playing, though? Yeah, as we went, but I kept tapping Sarah, like, oh, do yeah. this, do this. <laughs> Would you recommend this game to non-gamers? I think so. Like they so. see on the shelf? Okay. Yeah, I think that I would. It just it was um, pretty quick to learn. Yeah. It wasn't too challenging. Mm -hmm. So it was fun. Okay. Cool. Let's go on to Ink and Gold then, the second game. So this one, you have to, it's kind of like a push your luck. If two of the bad things come up, you lose all the treasure in front of you. And then when you flip it up, you put the gems on here and divide them up between all the players. And then you kind of decide each turn, like, are you going to stay or leave? So pretty simple again. Uh, what did you like about this game the most? I liked that it was kind of stressful when you're like, oh, I got one spider card. Mm, like, is there going to yeah. be another one? And you kind of mm -hmm. had to, like, push your luck, like yeah. you said. Mm -hmm. That kind of... That feeling is, like, fun to experience. It's almost yeah. like adrenaline. It's kind of like not gambling, but, like, risking, yeah. Yeah. Is there anything you didn't like? I didn't like that... I kept losing. <laughs> yeah, like if you if you're behind, it's kind of hard to catch back up unless you like yeah. just keep like risking well it every the time. First round but there's and, yeah. there's always that chance though that you could, mm -hmm. which is good. But I can see like if you fall behind, it kind of it can not be as fun for right. sure. Yeah. Uh, would you recommend this one for people? Yeah, I would. It would be fun to hang out with a group of friends and play this game. Yeah. Okay, so Haley, if you had to choose one, ones they're both set up on the table. Which one would you play first? Which one do you like best? If you had to pick. I think you're gonna be surprised. Yeah. I think I like the Magic Maze game You like better. Magic Maze best. I did. Really? It was challenging, and I've wow. said multiple times before, I like games that are challenging and involve some strategy. Do you like the cooperative aspect? Like, I we're do. all working together. I do, and we're I feel like you kind of learn about the people you're working with. Yeah. It. Like, yeah. how do their brains work, mm -hmm. and who takes the lead and stuff, and it's really yeah. interesting to see those dynamics I think that's unfold. cool. All right, let's see what Sarah thinks. Okay, now let's see what Sarah thinks. So we have Magic Maze first, cooperative game, trying to get your guys through the mall, eventually out. You can only move in certain directions, and it's all cooperative and silent, and there's a time element. So what did you like most about this game? I liked the colors that the artist used on the board game. Okay, it's bright and colorful, cheery. The idea of like escaping a mall is kind of fun, right? The idea of it, at least. Now, what didn't you like? <laughs> I don't like the idea of escaping from a mall because that's terrifying. Why do you need to escape from a mall? Is there a fire? Is there an attacker? Is there Well, they're stealing sales? magical items, obviously. Right? Okay. Did there you not be... like the silent aspect that you couldn't talk? I didn't like the silent aspect. Okay. I didn't like that like... Did you like this pawn that you're like telling people what to do? Yeah, the pawn was helpful, but when you didn't really know what to do yeah, because I couldn't tell you, you don't know what they want then you you're just do. like, what do you want from me? And then you can't do it. All right. I didn't well, like that part. With that, would you recommend it at all for people who don't play games? I would recommend it for companies that are trying to do like team building because you have to okay. like think on your toes and you have to work with other people. But if you're looking for something to kind of like relax and not be stressed out about, yeah. then I would not recommend it. So like in the right situation, it could be fun, but like not like a chill game or like stress, time, like team right. stuff. Okay. Right. Oh yeah. And cool. I didn't like that it was timed. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. Let's go to Ink and Gold then. What did you like most about this game? This is the one where you're going through the maze, you're dividing up gems, risking going through the temple. If two bad things come up, you lose all of your gems that you didn't save unless you left the temple, which you choose each turn. So what did you like? I liked this game because um, you really just had like two choices if you were gonna stay or yeah, leave. Yeah, very simple. Yeah, so it's easy just to make a decision. Mm -hmm. um, Did you like to push your luck? Like, should I go one more turn? One more turn? Like, keep going? Um, yeah, I kind did. Um, did I liked, you like the tents? Yeah, I like the tents and the manipulatives. They were fun to, mm -hmm. to hold on to and to play with. Um, what did you not like? Anything? I don't know if there's anything I didn't like. I think some people probably don't like the idea of like taking a risk. Yeah, it I just agree. depends on personalities. Now, would you recommend this one for people who don't play a lot of games? Yeah, that one I would recommend. Okay, yeah, it's nice because it's up to eight players and like it's quick, easy to teach, and you can have a lot of fun with it. So, yeah. I think it's pretty much self-explanatory. But which one did you like better? <laughs> this one. <laughs> okay, Ink and Gold. So that's funny. We have Haley liked Magic Maze more, and Sarah liked Ink and Gold more. Let's get to the final thoughts. Okay, everyone, those were their thoughts on Magic Maze and Ink and Gold. Hopefully that provides some insight for you, and tune in next time for our next non-gamer insight. See you, everyone.
Hi everyone, welcome to another Frog Punch Lunch episode, or whatever we're calling this now, thank you internet. But I've been away for a week or so due to commitments, so to make it up I'm going to do two top 10 gateway games list. First one is going to be anything uh, at least three years or newer, and the next one will be older than three years. It's just so you can get a decent amount of variety without seeing the same old, same old. Couple of caveats. Two-player games I'm keeping to a minimum, if none at all, and I'm leaving out party games. So no two-player abstract games and no party games. So without further ado, let's get going, because I've only got five minutes for this episode. Go. So number 10, Imhotep. Very easy, very light, but quite mean. You're basically sending building blocks to various buildings, and it's straight up dry Euro, but you have to manipulate the boats. You can really screw other players. Very simple to understand, but a great game nonetheless. Number 9 is Potion Explosion, Candy Crush the board game. You have a weird contraption that you drop these coloured marbles in and you're trying to make potions. You need various colours in order to complete the potions and then once you do, they have special effects that go off. Looks the part and plays the part. Uh, number 8 is ooh, doo, doo, Quadrapolis. Quadrapolis from Days of Wonder is a city building tile laying game. You simply take tiles from the central construction yard. Oh, sorry and you place them on your board. But where you can place them is restricted by which architect you use. There's a beginner version and an advanced version if you've started to get more into games. But the beginner version is still great fun because you've got to plan where you're going to put these buildings to get the most points. You can have city skyscrapers, you can have shops, you can have harbors and factories. You know, very cool, very light, and just very, very quick and really looks the part, just like any game from Days of Wonder. Uh, number seven is uh, Azul. Very entertaining. It's a straight up abstract game and you are placing tiles in the mosaic in order to get the most points. And But there's ways you collect the tiles and how you can screw other players over. Very simple and really cool game. Uh, number six is Downforce. Yeah, okay, it came out ages ago with a different title. Don't care. So simple. Play cards to bid and collect your car. Then race them around the track by playing the cards. Follow the card, tells you what colors move what. You just move them along the track, you can block each other and it gets everybody riled up. You bet on various stages which ones are going to finish first and you collect your money at the end, highest wins. Very simple racing game, but so much fun. Uh, number five is, quick, 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 uh, five, Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, one of the most gorgeous games on the planet that uses nothing but cardboard. This is from Blue Orange Games and you are growing trees in a forest. And as you grow trees, you get sunlight that travels around the board and shines from different areas but bigger trees will block the sunlight to your smaller trees, meaning that you won't get as much light. So you're constantly fending off the other player's trees in order to get more light for yourself and less for them. It's definitely, certainly more of a thinky game than most gateway games, but it's so simple to learn and looks, it is basically an Instagram's you know, dream come true because you can take so many good photos with this and it looks amazing. Uh, number four is Dream Home. Dream Home, really like this game. It's uh, you know, very popular with the friends I've got. You're building a house. You collect the cards off this uh, two row board based on the columns and you are building up your home. You're filling it with living rooms, kitchens, lounge, playrooms, etc. Sauna, dressing room, whatever you want. You know, stick a, a suit of armor in your living room, put a hot tub in your bathroom. And as you place them in, certain combinations will get you more points, but it's a very simple game. Caters for four players, fine, get the expansion, it'll do up to six. Love this game, so good, still on my shelf. Majesty for the Realm, this is going under the radar somewhat and I hate the fact that it is. This is from the same guy who did Splendor, you're collecting characters off this row and placing them in your village. Where you place them, collects you a certain amount of points, you're trying to get combos but you're trying to diversify and also get majorities. Really easy game, really good, looks good artwork, same guy who did Splendor, so if you like Splendor, check this out. Number two, very quickly, Celestia. This was uh, based on a reprint of Cloud9, and it's uh, you are on an airship going to various locations to collect treasures, i.e. points. But whoever sails it has to roll dice, and you have to play cards to match the hazards. But each player gets a chance to say, oh, I want to jump out of this bow, I don't think you can do it. Jump out, collect the points. It's a push your luck game with some element of bluffing, lots of laughs, does up to six players, which is a rare thing with most gateway games. Great little one, love it a bit. On my shelf as well, you know, it does the trick. And my number one is Baron Park. Yes, Baron Park right here. Does four players, so simple. You just place the tiles on your park. You get different sections for your park, putting in bear preserves and stuff like that. It's just basically a giant game of Tetris for multiplayer, but you can build your park in various ways. And when you get to the end, all you do is add up every single number. No weird scoring system or anything. Just add up the numbers, see your wins. Never had this go poorly, so much fun. Woo, and breathe. Hope you've enjoyed this list, and I hope I've given you a decent amount. Send me some feedback as to what you want to see in the future. Take care and enjoy your lunch. 
Well, folks, that's just about that for another Throat Punch Lunch episode. Hey, the last Throat Punch Lunch episode, possibly. More than likely. Uh, the next time we show up in a couple of weeks, we'll have a new uh, title. And probably just going to be the same show, though. Just changing the name. But anyway, as a reminder, go ahead and go into the comments section below and uh, make your vote for either Token Punch Lunch or Tropical Punch Lunch, and uh, we will go from there. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us as we present to you the content that we've created. Thank you, on that note, my content creators, my contributors, for all the hard work that you put into your segments on my show. I certainly do appreciate it. You guys are why Throat Punch Lunch or Token Punch Lunch or Tropical Punch Lunch is as good as it is. So thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you guys and gals on the flip side. <laughs>